welcome to the well here at STSA. It's been a while since I've been up here for the start of another series, but it's great to be here today. We are starting a new series about the tabernacle. And while I realize that on the surface may not seem like the most exciting topic, and some of you are like, the tabernacle seems kind of boring and Old Testament-y, and you may not feel like that might be the most exciting thing, well, I'm going to encourage you to stick with me here and give me a chance, because what I'm going to hopefully try to convince you of is that the tabernacle, which seems boring on the surface, is not only relevant for us today, but it is actually perfectly timed that God wants us to have this message here. And if you are one of those people who's like into the Bible and you like to dig in, especially the Old Testament, that's how I kind of am. I love to take like a passage and really study it and kind of go in depth, especially Old Testament. You're going to love this series. If you're not that kind of person, hopefully it will convince you to maybe become a little bit of that kind of a person, at least for the next four weeks. But before we get to the tabernacle, I want to talk about an experience that without knowing you, some of you I haven't met before, but I almost guarantee, I'll bet very high likelihood that this experience has happened to you before you've lived this experience as I have and many others have. Raise your hand if you ever set a goal to read the entire Bible cover to cover and failed. <laughs> okay, so my guess is those who didn't raise their hands, which I didn't see any, but let's say there's someone, it's not because they didn't fail, it's because they didn't set the goal, it's probably my guess, okay? Because every single one of us, you know, New Year, I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover. Or, you know, after Holy Week, I'm going to read the Bible. At retreat or that series, whatever it is, I'm going to read the Bible. And let me tell you how your experience probably went. Because I already know how it went, okay? You started off, just like me, you started strong. Because the Bible starts off strong in Genesis. Okay, we love the stories and it's exciting and it's new. Like Genesis, start, the Bible starts off with two people in the garden naked. Like it's the original Naked and Afraid show. Okay, like they stole it from there. So that's interesting and that's exciting. And then you got the Adam and Eve and then you got the flood and there's, there's stories and there's action. Then you got the patriarchs, you got the Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And every one of them, truthfully, is like a made for TV movie. Like it was made for Hollywood. You got, you got dysfunctional families. No, everyone loves a good dysfunctional family movie. And then you got betrayal, you got jealousy, you got seduction, you got murder. So you're like, oh, this Bible is so exciting. And then you finish Genesis and you just rolled through and now you're on to Exodus. Exodus is like the party just keeps on going because Exodus is exactly like a superhero story. It's exactly what it is. You have this group of people who are captured by the bad guys and they're enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians and like, whoa, what's going to happen to us? And will anyone out there? And then here comes a hero who swoops in to save the day. Okay, and it's Moses, and God sends Moses, and he sends him in the coolest possible way. There's a talking bush that's on fire. Okay, so this is like, this is better than Marvel Comics because it's real. These are real people. They're not injected or bitten by spiders, but we see great stuff. And what does a superhero do? Again, without any superpowers, he comes in and says, let my people go. Okay, one of like the most famous lines in all the movies. And boom, locust there. Boom, frogs over there. River to blood. Moon, uh, the sun turns to darkness. And it's like, yeah, look, the power, and it's exciting, and it's so cool. And it ends, that, that episode ends with Moses saying, okay, look, you didn't listen to anything I said? Now I'm going to drop the atom bomb right now. I'm going to do the mic drop right now of all mic drops. And he sends, he, God sends the angel of the Lord to come down and wipe out the firstborn of all of the Egyptians. And at the same time, Moses and the good guys make an escape through the night, like running after the train, okay? Like trying to get away, trying to get away. And then the bad guys are coming and the bad guys are coming. No problem for God. Opens up the Red Sea. Good guy. This is not superhero. This is real. Opens up the sea. Good guys walk through. Bad guys try to chase them. Sea closes on those guys and they drown. And the good guys come out on the other side and you're like, wow, this is exciting. And then the movie always ends. The Charlton Heston movie ends with going up the top of the mountain and the Ten Commandments. And you're like, this is great. And you finish that Ten Commandments scene and you're like, I can't wait for next week. Like what's on, what's on season two or season three? The Bible is so exciting. Action and drama. And then you get to Exodus chapter 25. <laughs> and that's usually where the wheels fall off the bus, so to speak. That's where the excitement goes down the toilet. That's where the Bible becomes mundane, boring. I want to say the word that I say as I'm reading it, and you probably said the same thing, is painful. Painful. Because that's when the subject that gets introduced is the tabernacle, which is the topic of our study here for the next four weeks. The tabernacle, for those who never heard of it or don't know what it is, is basically 
The first time that God commanded his people to build something, it's a physical structure, it's a building that we'll see what God wanted the people to do inside it. But in Exodus 25, after all these cool stories, God says, okay, now that we're in the wilderness, I want you to build this structure for me. And he starts to explain, and you're thinking to yourself, if you never read it, you're like, that doesn't sound boring. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a Home Depot guy. Like, I watch HGV, HGTV in the dentist's office, like everybody. Like, I get, what's so boring? Well, I brought you a sample. <laughs> and this is a sample. I could have brought many, many samples. This is from Exodus chapter 36. This is a sample of, of what, what happens after the excitement of the story. Talks about the curtains in the tabernacle. He made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain was four cubits. The 11 curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is the outermost one set. And 50 loops he made on the edge of the curtain of the second set. He also made 50 bronze clasps to couple the tent together that it might be one. Then he made a covering for the tent of the ram skins dyed red and a covering of badger skins above it. That's just a sample. Riveting stuff. It gets better. For the tabernacle he made with boards of acacia wood standing upright, the length of each board was 10 cubits and the width of a board a cubit and a half, each board of two tenons for binding one to the other. Thus he made all the boards for the tabernacle. He made the, board, the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, 40 sockets of silver. Here we get to talk about the sockets. The sockets is what really picks up, okay? 40 sockets of silver he made to go under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for his two tenons. And for the other side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made 20 boards and there 40 sockets of silver. Two sockets under each of the boards. For the west side of the tabernacle, he made six boards. He also made two boards for the back. Catch my breath. For the two back corners of the tabernacle, and they were coupled at the bottom and coupled together at the top by one ring. Anyone ready to quit? Let's keep going. Thus he made both of them for the two corners. So there were eight boards and their sockets. 16 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. And you thinking to yourself, amen, what a message I got today. This selection, this sample, which honestly, I could have just closed my eyes and done like this. After all that excitement that I just said about the Red Sea and the partying and the bad guys and the Ten Commandments, 13 of the final 16 chapters of the book of Exodus are like this. 13 out of 16. So that means if you're a chapter a day kind of a guy, that means you got to this part in the Bible and you're going to spend two weeks reading this about goat's hairs and what color there should be, and about the size of the cubits. You don't even know what a cubit is, but you memorize the size of everything in cubits, and about the sockets and the color and the type of material and this kind of wood that doesn't decay and this kind of wood and this kind of gold. Is. And you read this stuff for 13 out of 16 chapters, and some of you would say, you know what? That's okay. I can power through that. It's just two weeks. Well, I got a surprise for you. If you powered through those 13 chapters, what's waiting for you on the other side of the book of Exodus? Leviticus, which is even more boring. Because that book is not how to build the tabernacle, but it's what you do inside the tabernacle. And it gets even more painful and more boring because it says you bring this kind of pigeon on this day and it's got to make sure it looks like this. And this is how you bring it. And you step in with your right foot before your left foot and you wipe the blood like this. And then when you got a cow, you do this. And then you, this is how you debone it. Okay. And this is what you do with the fatty entrails. And this is what you do with the liver. And it's painful, painful, painful. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is most likely where you stop reading the Bible. This is most likely where you said, what's on TV? Or I'll read the cliff notes. But I want to talk about the tabernacle. Why is it so important? Why so much attention? Why so much detail? Like, who cares about the sockets? Who cares about the rings? Who cares about the colors? Who cares about the materials? Like, who cares how to debone a calf? Like, who cares? It might not seem it on the surface. But I want to try to convince you that the tabernacle is very important. And the reason it's given so much weight in scripture and so much space is because even though it's difficult, I'm not saying it's easy, even though it's difficult to understand, it actually teaches us a very, very important lesson because it's all about one thing. The tabernacle is the place of fellowship and communion between God and man. That's what the tabernacle is all about. The tabernacle is not just painful memorization. It's not like in chemistry, like learn the periodic table of elements just for the sake of. This is not just for the sake of the details, but the big picture. The tabernacle is about one thing. It's about fellowship between God and man. 
Fellowship between God and man is the theme of the Bible. It's the theme of everything. It's the theme of everything in Christianity. Go back to the very beginning. God created man in the Garden of Eden. He created them in a place where they had fellowship with him. That's what the garden was. It was a place where man and man lived. Okay, Adam and Eve, man lived. When I say man, I mean mankind. Man lived and God lived as well. And God walked with man and God talked with man and God shared with man and man shared with God. And man and God had this great fellowship together and everything was great in the garden. Then of course, as you know the story, sin ruined it. That pesky little serpent with a little apple came in there and ruined the whole thing. And once you had sin, now the fellowship was broken. God and man were no more in communion with one another. So what does God do when fellowship with man is broken? What does God do? His whole purpose in creation was to create fellowship with man. That is broken. What does God do? Does God give up on man? Of course not. God from that moment in time is on a mission to rebuild it. There's a book written, it's called On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, who's our patron saint. So if you've ever read that book, if you've never read that book, I would highly recommend it. It sounds complicated, but it's a very simple read. It's very short. On the Incarnation, St. Athanasius speaks about why did God send his son? Why did Christ take flesh? And he gives a great analogy. He says, imagine a person, okay, a rich person. Let's say you, okay, for, well, I'll, I'll modernize it. Okay, let's say you, 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 you made it big, okay, you got a promotion, you came into a lot of money, and you say, I'm going to build a house. Okay, I'm gonna build my forever house just for Father Timothy's sake, since he loves that. Okay, I'm gonna build my forever house. And you get the plot of land and you build the house and you customize it to your needs. Okay, you build the garage for your size truck and your motorcycle, whatever it may be. And you got everything that you need. The bathroom is perfectly just as you want it. You got a nozzle here in the shower and one there. And one. You got nozzles everywhere that you need them. You got the jacuzzi, you got the hot tub, you got everything. It's the perfect, perfect home that you dreamed of. And then you go away on vacation for a week and it gets vandalized by those pesky neighbors, those teenagers. You knew those teenagers were bad news when you saw them. Those teenagers vandalize your home. They cause damage. What do you do when you return from vacation? Knock it down? Say, start over? Say, you know what? I'm done with this house. I'm going to move to Florida. Is that what you do? What do you do? You do exactly what God would do. He rebuilds it. Whatever was knocked down, he rebuilds. Whatever was vandalized, he cleans. That's us. We were the price, the priceless, the masterpiece of God. Think of it like the Mona Lisa. Okay, the beautiful picture right there. The Mona Lisa, sin didn't ruin the image of, the Mona, of, 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 of God inside of us. All it did is cover it with dirt. If I got the Mona Lisa and someone throws some dirt on it, I don't throw it away, I clean it because it's still a priceless piece of art. That's exactly what happened with us. And when we lost fellowship with God, image of God was still inside of us and God said, I'm gonna, I gotta fix this thing. The tabernacle, listen carefully, the tabernacle was version 1.0 of the fixing plan. The tabernacle was not the fulfillment. The tabernacle was God's first attempt. Not that he, not, I didn't mean attempt, say like, and he failed that. Meaning like, that was the first draft, that's a better word. That was the first draft, or as we series, it's the blueprint of how to fix fellowship between God and man. The tabernacle is the blueprint. And that's why for us, we can say the tabernacle is a type of several things. The word type in Christianity means like a foreshadowing or a symbol of things to come. And we can say three things. Okay, we'll focus more on, on some than others. The, the tabernacle that God commanded Moses, first of all, was a type of the church. It was a foreshadowing of the church. It was the building, the physical presence of God among the people where the people were to come and worship God and have fellowship with God. That's why we come to church on Sunday. Number two, the tabernacle was a type of Virgin Mary. We actually say in the church hymns that she is the second tabernacle. Why? Because she was the place where God and man united. Okay, God and man united inside her womb. And she brought God and man among us. Okay, Jesus Christ was the, was the God man. She housed the God man. She was the type of the tabernacle. And then ultimately the true fulfillment of the tabernacle is Jesus Christ himself. Because he is the union of God and man. He is the fellowship of God and man. That's why St. Paul says this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. It says, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of his creation. So if for no other reason, if St. Paul says that Christ himself is a type of the tabernacle, or the other way around, the tabernacle is a type of Christ. If the tabernacle points us to Christ, there's reason why 
it's important for us to at least understand it, not memorize everything, but at least understand what the tabernacle is all about. I hope I convinced you to at least care about this series, okay? Even if I didn't, you're still stuck with me for another 20 minutes. Let's talk about the tabernacle. Here's a picture. Sometimes we get confused. I want to break it down, make it very, very simple. The tabernacle is not as complicated as you think. Maybe you've seen pictures and you see lots of different stuff going on. Here it is. It's very, very simple. There's two parts to the tabernacle. There's an outside piece and an inside piece. There's an outside piece and an inside piece. The outside piece, okay, that fence, okay, is, the, it, is, is 150 feet that way and 75 feet that way. It's 100, 150 by 75. So that gives you the dimensions. 150 feet is a half a football field, okay? So that kind of gives you about roughly how big it is. That fence, everything inside there would be called the tabernacle. Inside there, you see that tent-like structure that's at the top. That also is called the tabernacle. So you hear the word tabernacle can be used to refer to two different things. A, the entire compound, the entire campus, or B, just the actual tent, the indoor piece. You say, well, that's confusing. And I say, no, you're, we do the same thing. Think about the word church. Okay, if I, someone may say, uh, where are you going? Uh, I'm going to play soccer. Where are you going to play? We're going to play at the church. Or I'm going to Sunday school. Where? I'm going to the church for Sunday school. What that means is I'm going to the church campus and I'm going to play on the field of the church. Or I'm going to go to this classroom. But then you may be on the soccer field in the, at the church and you may say, okay, now let's go pray. Where are we going to pray? Let's go inside the church. So the church can mean the sanctuary, but it also means the campus. Does that make sense? Same thing here. The tabernacle was the whole campus, but the actual tabernacle was that tent-like structure that's at the top. So first, the outer area was very simple. You had the fence and you had two pieces of furniture. You have a bronze altar, the square thing at the bottom of the screen, and then you have a bronze laver. And labor just means a big bowl of water. That's all it is, where people used to wash their hands. We'll talk about, each week we'll take a different component. So next week we'll talk about the outside piece. Those, the bronze altar, bronze labor. Sometimes you hear those referred to as the brazen altar or the brazen labor. Brazen just means bronze, but somehow it sounds more spiritual, so it's cooler to say the brazen altar, okay? But it just means made of bronze. The second thing is you have that tent. Now inside the tent, no more bronze, everything is gold. So outside is bronze, inside is gold. That inside tent, the tabernacle, has two sections. The first section is called the holy place, and then the second section, very creatively titled, is called the most holy place. See how that works? Very creative. The holy place and then the um, most holy place. And if there was a third, it'd be like the most, 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 most. So let's start with first the holy place. Okay, that's the first section had three pieces of furniture inside, all made of gold. Anyone want to guess? Anyone know their Bible? What were the three pieces of furniture inside? Shout it out. So, okay, so if one, there was a lampstand. I don't know who said it. A golden lampstand, okay? That's one. Sorry? There was a table. Very good. Very good. So those were on the two sides. A table of showbread and the golden lampstand. What was in the front? No, mercy seat. We'll get into the next one. Another altar. The altar of incense. Okay, we'll talk about that in two weeks, okay? But just I want you to get that rough outline because it's not as complicated. Table of showbread, golden lampstand, altar of incense. Now you enter the most holy place, also called the Holy of Holies. And inside there, there's really only one thing, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones movies, that's what that's about, okay? And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was three things, three items. Who knows what those three items were? The rod of Aaron, the pot of manna, the other one's the most obvious one, Ten Commandments, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, because okay, so that's what was inside. So again, there's the whole, there it is. You, now you know everything about the tabernacle. You just learned it in three minutes. You have to read a uh, hundred chapters in the Bible to get through the sockets and everything like that, but that's what it all boils down to. You got the outer courtyard, which has got the bronze altar and the bronze laver. You got the tabernacle in two sections, the holy place, show, table of showbread, golden lampstand, altar of incense. Then inside, you got the Ark of the Covenant. And inside, pot of manna, uh, a rod of Aaron, and Ten Commandments. Each week in this series, we're going to take a different piece. So don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it right now, but we'll get into it. How many chapters in the Bible speak about the tabernacle? Anyone want to guess? How many chapters total? Anyone guess? Seven? I already told you, at least 13. 50. 
50. In case you're keeping track at home, that's 13 in Exodus, 18 in Leviticus, 13 in Numbers, 2 in Deuteronomy, and 4 in the book of Hebrews. 50 chapters about the tabernacle. In case, just to put that in perspective, again, if you're a chapter a day guy, that'll take you more than seven weeks of day after day reading about the tabernacle. And let's be honest, most of us are a chapter a day, but we'd skip weekends, okay? At best, we'd five. So that's 10 weeks that you would be reading about this. Did you know that 50 chapters is longer than every other book in the Bible, except three? 50, so right now you're not talking about chapters about the tabernacle. You're talking about books of the Bible are not as long as 50 chapters. Only three books in the Bible are longer than 50, since we're on the trivia. Anyone want to guess? Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Very good. Those are the only three. The tabernacle is longer than every other book in the Bible. My point is to show is that it's important and that's why it's given that weight, because ultimately, like I said, the tabernacle is the 1.0 version of why Christ came into this world. It's the 1.0 version of the incarnation. So let us see right now, quickly, with the time we got remaining, the purpose of the tabernacle and how it relates to us. There are two purposes, primary purpose. Well, yeah, two primary purposes, but one is kind of more primary, and the other one is secondary, but it's related to it, so they're connected. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is easy. I already mentioned that. The primary purpose of the tabernacle was worship. It was a place of intimacy. Take a step back right here. The history goes, as I already recounted, the people were in slavery and the people were in, captured by the bad guy. God frees them by sending a savior. Tell me if you see the parallels here to Christ. The people were enslaved to the bad guy. A savior comes along and frees them, but they have to believe in the savior and they have to say, okay, we trust you and we're going to follow you. And then that Savior says, okay, come follow me and I'll take you to the promised land. But first, we have to go through the Red Sea. You have to go through water. You see the parallels? You see where we're going with this? You have to go through the water. And that water for us is obviously the water of baptism. And they say, okay, great. I went through the water of the Red Sea. Now I get to the promised land. No, 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 no. You got to spend a long time in the wilderness. And in fact, most of you are going to die in the wilderness. But don't worry. We will get to the promised land eventually, but you're going to spend most of your life in this, in this wilderness. And for us, the wilderness, okay, symbolizes life on this earth, and we're waiting for the promised land to come. When they're in the wilderness, God gave them the first tool that they needed, the most important tool, he gave them the law, gave them the Ten Commandments. That comes to us in Exodus chapter 20, and he gives them shout nots. And then in the next three chapters, it's an explanation of the Ten Commandments. So Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. And then the next three chapters are like the detail. So for example, Exodus 20 says, thou shalt not murder. The next three chapters explain like, okay, so if you murdered by accident, then this. And if you murdered premeditated, then this. And then, it, you know, it said, thou shalt not steal. And it said, this is what happens if someone steals from their neighbor's cow. This is what happens if someone steals their neighbor's wife. This is what happens if someone steals their neighbor's, you know, ax or whatever it may be. So he gives the law, the big picture, and then he goes through all the details. And then Exodus chapter 24, verse three, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words of the Lord has said, we will do. We accept everything that he said. Next verse. Then he, meaning Moses, took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So again, we heard the law, we understand it, we're gonna do it. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. The story should end there. The story is, I freed you. I saved you. I'm going to take you there. Here's the law. Don't do this. Don't do this. And it should be over. But it's not over. And the reason that it's not over is because God's goal in case you may, this may be confused in some of our minds. God's goal isn't to get his children to obey him. Some of us think that way, that the goal of Christianity is to obey God. That the reason we do everything, that all God wants us to do is do whatever, not do that, do that, and then God is happy. That's like saying that the goal of having children is to get them to clean their room and do the laundry. We would love that to happen, Okay, we would love that to happen, but even we're not dumb enough to believe it's actually going to happen long term. But the point is, that's not the goal. The clean the room and the do the laundry is a step along the way. 
But it's not the end goal. The goal is much greater. The goal is much more relational. So I say it this way. God's desire isn't just obedience from us. It's intimacy with us. Did you know that? God's desire isn't just obedience from us. It's intimacy with us. We confuse the two. And I'm not against obedience. Obedience is important. But I'm against obedience as the end goal. Imagine an engaged couple, each living on their own, and they come together and they say, hi, my name is so-and-so, my name is so-and-so, nice to meet you, okay, whatever. Uh, do you wanna get married? Sure, let's get married, okay. I promise I won't cheat on you, okay, I promise I won't cheat on you. I promise I'll do my chores, I promise I'll do my chores. I promise I'll, you know, I'll do the trash, you do the dishes, I'll do the whatever, and they agree on all the rules of marriage, and they shake hands. Is that a happy marriage? Will they now celebrate and say, we're married? This is great. Is that what marriage is? No. Those things, those logistics, that obedience, that's just the prerequisite to the good stuff. That's just the stuff that you got to get through. You got to agree. We're not going to cheat on each other. We got to agree that somebody's got to take out the trash. Somebody's got to do the, like someone's got to pay the bills. We agree to that as a means to an end. But the end is the intimacy. The end is the fun stuff. All the other stuff is just a prerequisite. It's just a warm-up show. It's just like the, 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 the stuff you got to do to get to the good stuff. Well, that's what we learned in the tabernacle. God gave them the law and they accepted the law. They said, we'll do the law. And God's like, okay, good. Now we can have the intimacy, tabernacle. As soon as he gave them the law, they accepted it. And if God didn't care about intimacy, he'd say, I left you with the law. I'll check back, give me a status report. But God's saying, I'm giving you the law. Now you agree? Now tabernacle begins. Now the dwelling place begins. Now the good stuff, the intimacy. We confuse the two. Sometimes I may ask a person, how's your spiritual life? And often I hear, oh, I struggle with this sin. Okay, but how's your spiritual life? Oh, I got this problem. God didn't give me this. Okay, but how's your spiritual life? Oh, these struggles. Oh, these. Okay, those are great. And I'm all for it. Try to stop the sin. The str like I'm all for that stuff. But you realize that's not the spiritual life. You realize that's why anyone who's come to me in confession, you know this. You sit there and give me a laundry list of all your sins, and I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now tell me about your spiritual life. Tell me about the positive. Tell me about your time in prayer. Tell me about your fellowship with God. Are you in the Word of God? Are you experiencing intimacy with God? Because that's the spiritual life. Like all the other stuff is steps along the way. But agree with me on this. You can obey everything God tells you to do and have no intimacy. And that's not the spiritual life. That's not the goal. It's just to obey. You know the difference between intimacy and obedience? Think of the difference between a servant and a son. On the surface, they look the same. Like if you came to, I don't have servants, but let's say I had servants, okay? <laughs> let's say you came to my house and I got servants and I got sons. On the surface, if you don't know who they are, you might not be able to tell them apart. Because to one, I'm saying, go mow the lawn. The other, I'm saying, go do the dishes. The other one I'm saying, uh, make sure that you clean your room. I say, make sure you clean that bathroom, whatever it is. So on the surface, it's like they're both cleaning. They're both doing stuff. They're both obeying. But what's the difference? At the end of the day, one punches out and goes home. And the other one comes in daddy's lap. Did you know that God didn't create us to be his servants? God created us to be his sons and daughters. And Jesus said it this way, John 15, verse 5. Actually, it's 15, 15. That's a typo. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Look, he says, the difference between a servant and a friend is you know something, intimacy. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I've made known to you. There's an experience. There's an intimacy. There's a sharing. There's a fellowship. Too many of us, I'm telling you, God didn't create us to be his servants. God created us to be his sons and daughters. With all due respect, you are a great servant of the Lord. He's got better. If God needed servants, like with all due respect, he got the angels. And the angels do everything that he needed. And we are great. And look here, Father Anthony preaches a great sermon. And this person teaches a great Sunday school class. And this person cleans those chairs. Okay, you're a great servant. You're a great servant. God got better servants. We don't serve because he created us as servants. We serve out of our desire to honor our father. He wants sons and daughters. A relationship. Tell me if you agree with this. A relationship full of obedience, but void of intimacy will not last. You agree or disagree? A relationship full of obedience, 
but void of intimacy will not last. It'll last in the short term. You can power through that Holy Week. You can get through a few years in the Christian thing. Like you can put on the, the good, the, 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 the mask and you can do the thing and you can power through every Sunday and here we go, go to church. It stinks, but you just got to do it. You can power through it. But a relationship full of obedience and void of intimacy won't last. So please, for my sake, for your sake, don't limit your relationship with God to just obedience. I'm not saying don't do obedience. Obedience is very important. Obedience is very important because also you can't have the intimacy without the obedience, so you need both. But I'm saying don't limit yourself. Your relationship with God is more than just A, B, and C. Your relationship with God is more than just go to church, punch in and punch out. More than just say a few prayers. Your relationship with God is intimacy. That's why one of the things that I always try to emphasize in my sermons when I speak to people is the, is the church, the teachings, the sermons, everything we do. It's not about what God wants from us. It's about what God wants for us. You heard me say it a million times. Y'all don't listen to anything I say. It's not about what God wants from us. It's about what God wants for us. That's what it is. What God wants for you, in case you didn't know, is not just your obedience. He wants to fill you with peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what he wants to do. He wants to fill you with joy. Joy that no one can steal from you. He wants to overwhelm you with love. The eternal, everlasting love that is unconditional and, and never goes away no matter what you do. That's what he wants. And that's why we do everything that we do. And that's what the tabernacle reminds us of. God put the tabernacle there amongst his people and said, I'm going to sit here. The way the tabernacle was, was placed, the tribes of Israel were all around on all sides. So you had the camp, you had three tribes to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. The tabernacle sat in the middle of them. And God said, I will sit there in your midst every single day as a place that you can come and remember that I am here in the middle of you and I'm here as a place of intimacy to have with you. Now, in case you ask yourself, this is not our topic for today, but just want to mention this. In case you ask yourself, okay, I want that intimacy with God. What do I do? Where do I start? How do I begin? That's not our topic for today, but I heard a great sermon <laughs> by a great preacher called Sitting with Jesus. Okay, and it was, a, it was actually a, a year ago. It was last summer. I gave a sermon about sitting with Jesus where I talked about the way I approach quiet time. And I'm not saying I got the end-all, be-all. But if you're looking for a place to start, this is some like tips that work for me and some suggestions. This is how I approach my time with God. So put up there on the screen, if you want to scan that QR code, it'll take you straight to the, 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 the YouTube, the video. Okay, you can check that out on your own. But the bottom line is that if you are missing out on intimacy with God, you're missing out on the whole thing. You're not missing out on a piece. You're missing out on the whole thing because in the end, that's what it boils down to. So number one, the primary purpose of the tabernacle, intimacy. Place of worship, I'm sorry, worship, a place of intimacy. There's a secondary purpose of the tabernacle, which may seem unrelated, but let me show you how it's actually connected to the first one. The secondary purpose is sacrifice a place of grace. I told you earlier that Exodus talks about how to build a tabernacle. Leviticus comes in and says what you do there. And what you do there is you make sacrifices. Offer this pigeon, offer this grain, offer this cow, whatever it may be. What was the purpose of the sacrifice? Why did God tell his people to do sacrifices? God wanted to control the pigeon population? God needed grain? It was just a way of, like, uh, of taxes? Is that what it was? Why did God give sacrifices? The reason God gave sacrifices as a way of restoring, again, this was 1.0 version, okay? Because it's all fulfilled in Christ, the true sacrifice. But the tabernacle points us to it. The sacrifice was there as a means to restore the brokenness of the relationship between God and man. That's what the sacrifice is all about. It was when there's a problem, when there's a sin, when there's a mistake, you offer the sacrifice, now fellowship is restored. That's why Christ was the true sacrifice that once for all, Okay, where, by which we have access to the Father. Let's go a passage from Leviticus chapter 1. It's just three, two verses from the very beginning of Leviticus. Could have brought you many more. They all have the same theme. When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering to the, of livestock. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. 
It will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. This is one type of sacrifice. God gives more sacrifices, and the theme of them all is to restore God and man. Take a step back again. Think about this, okay? I told you the sequence of events. God frees the people and says, here's the law. The people said what when they got the law? We're going to do it all. And as soon as the people say we're going to do it all, God says, okay, great. Now here's a way of sacrifices when you break the law. And they're like, but we said we're going to do it all. But God's like, trust me, you're, you're going to need this. You're going to need this. Just trust me on this one. God was preemptive. And it turns out that he knew what he was talking about because while Moses was upstairs getting the law, the people were downstairs practicing for dancing with the stars with the golden calf, okay? So God knew something. God knew something. God knew something. God knew that humanity, not me and you, the Old Testament people, not me and you, God knew that humanity would struggle to do what they said they would do. What they said, I promise I'm never going to do. What they said, I crossed my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I'm never going to do that again. I promise. I commit. I, I, God knew that those people would struggle with that. That those people would say they're never going to lie, then they'd lie again. That those people would know the harmful effects of gossip, but somehow they would sneak into it again. That those people would say that somehow we look at it, and so we don't call it judging. We talk about just you know, observing what's going on around us. That those people might be judgmental of some sorts. He knew. So what God did is he was preemptive and he gave the system of sacrifices. And I want to show you a passage right now, okay? Of course, every verse that we show up here on the screen is very important. Every verse is word of God, very important. But I'll show you great verses. And I'm going to show you three, uh, four verses, sorry. It's from Psalm 103, verse 11 to 14. I'm going to put it up on the screen in a second. But the reason why I want to prepare you is because if you struggle, especially if you struggle with guilt, if you struggle to know you're forgiven, if you struggle feeling bad, you need to not read Psalm 103, verse 11 to 14. You need to memorize Psalm 103, verse 11 to 14. And I promise you, these are four verses that I've carried deep inside here that have gotten me through many, 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 many a rough time. So here you go. That's the preparation for these great verses. It says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And then here's the best part. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Sometimes people come to me in confession. they would be like, Abuna, I did something really bad. I mean, really bad. And they say whatever they did bad. And I say to them, you know who you're surprised, but you know who's not surprised? And they're always like, you? And I'm like, I'm not surprised, but not because I think you're a horrible person, but I'm not, but that's not, I'm not saying whether I'm surprised. You know who's not surprised? God's not surprised. Because he knows our frame. He remembers that we are, we forget that we're dust. We think highly of ourselves, but God's like, huh, here's the sacrifices. Trust me, you'll need it. But God, I'm never, I'm never just, 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 just. God gave the system of sacrifices. First, God gave the path to intimacy. And said, here you go. I want to be one with you. Tabernacle, come on in. But the problem is if there's sin, there's something blocking. So instantly, the second he gave the tabernacle, he said, here's a system of sacrifices. Because God knew this one fact that hopefully you and I know as well. There can be no intimacy apart from grace. There can be no intimacy apart from grace. There can be no intimacy with God apart from the grace of God. And here's the part, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant right here, but just bear with me, it won't be long. Usually, we don't think of the Old Testament as grace. And sometimes people come to me, we've all said it before, so I'm not judging or anything. How come Old Testament God is so angry and mean and New Testament God is so nice? New Testament God is grace, Old Testament God is wrath. And anytime someone says it to me, I ask them legitimately, are you actually reading the Old Testament or are you just saying what you heard? Or you, someone told you, or you, you read, read this on a blog or something like that, because anyone who actually reads the Old Testament would not ever say that. You would say that based on what you think it says. But read what it says, and you will see, in my opinion, just my opinion, I see grace of God in the Old Testament much more than the New Testament. Much more. You know why? Because the Old Testament, every single page of it is the people making mistake, the people messing up, the people being the dumbest people on the planet, the people forgetting everything, and the people messing up, messing up, and God's like, y'all messed up. I'll give you another chance. And then they mess up again. And I'll give you another chance. And then God's like, I can't take these people. These people, they don't know. Like every time I give them another chance, they mess it up again. And I can't stand these people. 
Okay, but let's give him another chance. Every page of the Old Testament is God saying, I hate what you're doing, but I'll give you another chance. I'll send you another prophet. I'll send you another priest. I'll send my own son. How can you look at the Old Testament and not see the grace of God? Because every time, the, never once the people were successful. And every single time, God never left his people. There can be no intimacy without grace. And thankfully for us, we don't have the, ta that was tabernacle 1.0, sacrifices 1.0. We had the fulfillment of it. The true tabernacle is Christ. Okay, church and Christ, but we we'll talk about just Christ. True tabernacle, true tabernacle is Christ. And the system of sacrifice that he's given us, what does God want from us? What kind of sacrifice is pleasing to God now? Pigs, pigeons, grain, hot dogs? Like what does God want? The true sacrifice of God, I didn't bring it up on the screen, but you know the verse, maybe you've heard it before. The true sacrifice of God is A, broken and contrite heart. That's the true sacrifices. And that's the sacrifice that leads us back to intimacy with God. Because there can be no intimacy without grace, and the grace comes when we offer the sacrifice. The sacrifice doesn't make up for the crime. You killed or whatever, you lied or whatever, you stole whatever, you offer this pigeon, you offer this cow, doesn't, sa doesn't make up for it. And in the same way, my words of repentance can never make up for my sin, but God accepts it upon his holy altar. And that's the way back to intimacy. I'll give you another golden verse right here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Another good memory verse for you. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Usually when we think of the throne of God, very few people think of a throne of grace. The word throne usually gives us bad vibes. We think of judgment. We think of anger. We think of sentencing. But notice the throne of God is not a throne of any of those things. God doesn't sit on his throne and, and, and condemn people to life sentences in prison. God sits on his throne and says to you, I sentence you to grace. You did really bad, two graces. You did 50 bad, 50 graces. And all he's doing from his throne is shouting out grace, shouting out grace, shouting out grace. So why wouldn't we come? And that's why it says there, come boldly. Again, son and a slave, a son and a servant. If both of them are in the house, I have my son, I have my servant. Okay, both of them in the house, both of them do something bad. Let's say they were you know, dribbling the ball and they broke the vase or whatever, if we had a vase, okay, they broke it. Okay, each of them is gonna approach me with a different feel, feeling. The son, well, let's start, yeah, the son will approach me with boldness and he'll say, dad, I'm sorry, but he knows that he's my son and while he might get something, he's still gonna sleep in the house that night. The servant knows, it was nice knowing you. Have a nice day. You're fired. The servant approaches in fear because the servant knows that he's not tied to the master and the master could get rid of him the drop of a hat. And he's probably his last day at the, at the she, uh, she Mesa, okay, or whatever, okay. That's his last day at the residence. But the son comes with boldness, knows his place. So that's why for us, here's your homework assignment for this week. I want you to do three things with the tabernacle of God that is amongst us today. You come daily, you come boldly, you come as sons, not as servants. Again, you come daily, you come boldly, come as sons, not servants. Last thing I want to say, and I'll get you out of here. I asked myself, why do I spend time with God? Like, why do I... Like nobody for, it's not like the Pope calls me and says, did you do your quiet time today? Like there's, there's, there's no like, like I don't have to check in. So if I don't want to read the Bible, I don't want to do my quiet time, I don't have to. No, like no one's going to force me. Like we're adults here, like I don't have to. So I ask myself a question, why do I? Like I'm asking you to do your quiet time, sit with Jesus. So I said, why do I do it? And I came up with a few reasons, okay? None of the reasons are because I have so much free time. Because usually when you ask someone to you do your quiet time, what's well, so I'm busy. And busy has nothing to do, like, it's not like, oh, I do it because I have free time. So it has nothing to do with that. So number one, I wrote down, I wrote down several things. That's where I find clarity when I'm confused. Clarity when you're confused, see if you value that. That's where I find encouragement when I'm down. So I find strength when I'm weak. That's when I find reminders when I forget. That's where I find... Kicking the pants when I need it, 
We all need a kick in the pants every now and then. And that's also when I find a loving hug when I need that as well. If I had to summarize all those in one word, I would say that's where I find help in time of need. That's what St. Paul said in Hebrews 4.16. That's why we come boldly to the throne of grace. Because that's where we find help. And whatever that help is, you need wisdom, you need strength, you need a kick in the pants, you need a reminder. It's there. And it's waiting for you. But the question is, will you come? And I'm saying, I want to come daily. I want to come boldly. I want to come as a son, not as a servant. And I hope that you want to do the same. Tabernacle is not so bad, is it? We're going to dig into it over the coming few weeks. If you want to read more about it, like I said, it's in Exodus 25 through the end in the book of Leviticus. But don't worry, we'll go, we'll, we'll go over the highlights of it next week. Um, so hopefully I'll see you back for that. Let's stand up together for a prayer. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you for your never-ending grace. Thank you, Lord, that, that you not just built a tabernacle among the people of Israel, but you yourself came and tabernacled among us. You came and took flesh. And you're here, Lord, in our midst now. You're here every Sunday on the altar. And you're here, Lord, so that we could have a place to have intimacy and fellowship with you. Lord, please help us. Help us, Lord, to come to you daily. Come to you boldly. Come, Lord, as sons, not as servants. And remove from us, Lord, anything that is, that is stopping us from doing those things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your grace. And, and we pray that we can walk worthy of the calling with which you have called us with. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Lord, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.